Now, what's called, what I call cosmic justice has been called by some people social justice. But I think they're unduly modest because they're trying to correct not only the uh, inequities that they see in society, they're trying to, to correct the oversights of God or the defects of the cosmos. Uh, when, when some people are born uh, with physical or mental handicaps, they want to counterbalance that. And of course, that's not always caused by society. So that when Rawls says that undeserved inequalities, he includes all sorts of things. And that, that opens up a very large area uh, for, uh, for others. You can find this perspective on uh, justice, the Rawlsian perspective, in many places, from the street corner community activists right up to the chambers of the Supreme Court. For example, a few years ago, a, uh, an admissions director at Stanford University wrote a book in which she pointed out that during all her years as an admissions director, she had never required students to submit achievement tests. Because some of those students, uh, she said, through no fault of their own, attended schools where they could not have acquired the, the skills necessary to do well on such tests. So she's trying to redress the inequalities, and therefore she would simply not require such tests. Uh, the, co the educational testing service is currently engaging in a, a renorming of test scores to take into account the social backgrounds and handicaps of the students so that the score will then, again, redress pre-existing inequalities rather than applying the same standards uh, to everybody. Uh, whenever I hear the notions of fairness in education, I think back to my own education. And I think, thank God my teachers were unfair to me when I was a kid growing up in Harlem. Uh, one of these teachers was a lady named Miss Simon, who belonged to what might be called the General Patton School of Education. Uh, I cannot even imagine that Miss Simon gave a moment's thought to my self-esteem. <laughs> Every word that we misspelled in her class had to be written 50 times not in class, but as part of our homework. And there was always plenty of other homework from her and other teachers. And so you misspell four or five words and you had quite an evening ahead of you. <laughs> Very little chance of listening to the Lone Ranger. Now, was this fair in Rawlsian terms? And the answer is no. Like many of the children in Harlem at that time, I came from a home where nobody had gone beyond elementary school. I still remember what a big fuss was made when I was promoted to the seventh grade because I'd gone further than anyone else. Uh, in later years when I graduated from Harvard, it, there was no such fuss. They expected me to. <laughs> <laughs> but fairness was never an option. There was nothing that Ms. Simon or anybody else could do about the fact that we came from homes uh, where we did not I have books and magazines, and we were not as familiar with those words as people from other neighborhoods might have been. So that was never an option. Uh, nothing that the schools could have done would have changed that. It would have been an irresponsible self-indulgence for them to have pretended to make things fair. If there's anything worse than unfairness, it is make-believe fairness. They could, like the College Board apparently is trying to do, pretended that we knew more than we did. And that would have made them feel good. It would not have done much for us. Instead, they forced us to meet standards that were a little harder for us to meet than they were for some other kids, but far more necessary for us to meet, because that was the only way out of poverty. Many years later, I happened to uh, run into one of the other kids from Harlem who w went to that same school at the same time. Uh, and by now, he was a, a psychiatrist. He owned a, a home in the Napa Valley and property out there. In fact, n now he's uh, retired, living overseas with servants, while yours truly is still trying to make a living. <laughs> but as we uh, reminisced about the uh, things that had happened in the old days and what had happened in between, one of the things he mentioned was that over the years, his various secretaries had commented on the fact that he seldom misspelled a word. <laughs> I told him that my secretaries had made that very same observation 
and that if they knew Miss Simon, there would be no mystery as to why we did not misspell words. Now, it so happens I became a high school dropout. But what I was taught before I dropped out was enough for me to score higher on the verbal SAT than the average Harvard student, which may have had something to do with my being admitted to Harvard in an era before affirmative action was even thought of. What if the teachers had, uh, those of that era had been imbued with the present day conception of fairness? Uh, where would my schoolmate and I be today? On welfare, in prison, perhaps in a halfway house if we were lucky? And would that not have been an injustice? To take individuals capable of independent, self-supporting, and self -direct, being self-directed women and men with pride in their own achievements and turn them into dependents, clients, supplicants, mascots. Now the primary purpose of mascots is to minister to symbolize something that makes other people feel good. The actual fate of the mascot himself is seldom a major consideration. The uh, argument here is not against real justice or real equality. Both of these things are desirable in themselves. The only argument is that some versions of these things are simply impossible. And that trying the impossible has costs and, and real dangers as well. Uh, after all, the people who manned the communist movement around the world before the Soviet Union was established didn't devote themselves to this cause for the sake of creating gulags and, se and secret police and territorial aggrandizement. They did it because they were seeking social justice. But what actually happened shows some of the costs and some of the dangers of that. Most ordinary Americans still have the traditional conception of justice. And that means the people who have this cosmic notion of justice must misrepresent what is happening as being a violation of traditional justice. And therefore, they must, for example, misrepresent test results as being either arbitrary barriers to advancement or deliberate efforts to perpetuate inequalities. As Joseph Schumpeter once said, the first thing a man will do for his ideals is lie. The next thing he will do, and this is my addendum, is character assassination. Those people who disagree with those with a vision of cosmic justice must be stopped, in their view, by all means necessary. And that, of course, includes character assassination. Uh, they must be bought, to use a verb of our time. Now, the people who are the victims of this atmosphere of character assassination are not simply those who are targeted. The whole society is a victim because you're not going to be able to attract into the public arena people who value their privacy, who value protecting their families from humiliations uh, if, in fact, disagreements become simply grounds for smears. In a sense, the people who are caught up in the vision of cosmic justice are also victims. Because once having demonized other people, they really cannot go back to square one and re-examine the evidence and find out whether what they've been advocating has been producing the results they want or producing totally different results. And so they're locked into the vision. They have too much of a stake in it to ever uh, think, think about doing something different. I have a chapter in the book called The Tyranny of Visions about how, how the vision becomes more real to people than any empirical reality. A classic example was one described by Paul Johnson, uh, Lenin. And Johnson pointed out that Lenin, although he spoke of himself as a representative of the proletariat, had in fact never set foot in a working class neighborhood in any of the cities he'd ever been in, inside or outside of Russia. He had never talked with the workers and had no idea what they believed about anything. I might add that, all, that uh, he also, after becoming the ruler of Russia, never set foot in Soviet Central Asia, which is an area larger than all of Western Europe. 
and in which all these doctrinaire schemes from Moscow were imposed for nearly three quarters of a century with devastating results. What he was devoted to was the vision, not flesh and blood people. A flesh and blood people were a complication on the road to realizing the vision. And as it turned out, if he had to kill a few million of those, that was just so much too bad. And of course, we've seen Hitler, Mao, and others with the same approach. Now, fortunately, we have thus far in this country had much more uh, milder versions of this. But you can see also this notion of looking for visions and the abstractions that go with those visions, rather than with flesh and blood people. For example, there's a great deal of uh, talk about income distribution. And you might think that this is talk about income distribution among people. It's not. It's talk about income distribution among abstract statistical categories. We're constantly hearing how the top 20% of American uh, uh, income earners, households, um, make X times as much as the bottom 20%. But these are not people. In terms of people, there are 39 million people in the bottom 20%. There are 64 million people in the top 20%. These are not percents of people. These are percents of households. And households vary with income, with race, with time, and with all sorts of other variables. Uh, we hear talk about the rich and the poor. And what amazes me is how seldom they define what that means. Uh, I remember some years ago uh, talking with a lady who was discussing her financial difficulties. And I said, do you realize that you are among the top 10% of wealthiest Americans? And she looked at me as if I were crazy. But she was, but merely by owning a home in Palo Alto at California real estate prices. She was one of the 10% top. And if she wanted to move out into a, uh, into a tent with her family, she could, have been, she could have boasted of being one of the richest people around. Unfortunately, if she wanted to move into an apartment indoors, also at California prices, she would have been worse off. Uh, most people have no idea what is meant by this top 20% who are so routinely described as rich, where that begins. And I, I just received, before I came out here from California, the latest census data. And uh, any household, that has a total income of $75,000 is in that top 20%. That is, any husband and wife making $38,000 a year each is in that top 20%. Uh, these, these are the rich whose taxes we dare not reduce for fear of pandering to entrenched wealth. Uh, genuinely rich people and genuinely poor people, I think would come to something like less than 7% of the total American population. And yet political campaigns and debates are carried on as if these were the two great classes in society. And the other 93% of us don't really count. Brawls has something which he calls the difference principle, which he says that no policy should be uh, advocated uh, if it does not help those on the bottom. Now, the problem with applying that in the American society is that those on the bottom don't stay on the bottom. In fact, no, no, uh, in no quintile of the income distribution do the people tend to stay there. People are constantly moving among these brackets. A study was done some years ago showing that at the end of eight years, more of the people who were in the bottom 20% at the beginning were now in the top 20% than remained in the bottom 20%. So you have this enormous turnover of people in these brackets, and yet the discussions of income distribution are always discussion of the relationships among those brackets, not among flesh and blood people. I think most of us, if, uh, if every millionaire in America went broke and was immediately replaced by someone in poverty who became a millionaire, most of us would consider that to be quite a redistribution of income. The way the numbers are, are used, that would be no redistribution at all because the brackets would have the same relationship to each other as before. And they're talking about the brackets, not about the people who are moving among these brackets. In any case, uh, Rawls has what he calls the difference principle, that those on the bottom, he seems to assume that they're sort of permanently on the bottom, uh, are the acid test of whether a policy is good. If this policy helps millions of other people and does not help those on the bottom, then it should not go into effect, according to Rawls. Now, if you have a fluid society, 
in which anyone who wants to rise has a very high probability of being able to rise, then what you're saying is that you're making the well-being of those who don't choose to do anything be preemptive over the well-being of other people. It means that if someone were to come up with a policy that would benefit masses of people, that would enable, for example, every poor child in America to get the finest education possible, develop his talents to the fullest, that that policy should not be put into effect if it did nothing for some wino lying drunk in the gutter. And so what uh, Rawls calls the difference principle, uh, I call the wino's veto. <laughs> Thank you very much.